Welcome to another episode of The Crease. We're here with Mr. Jimmy Adams, past national representative, past West Indies rep rep representative as well, and the current director of cricket for Cricket West Indies. Mr. Adams, good evening. Yay! <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> right, so first question, where did your love for cricket begin? Um, it started at home. Uh, my, my father was, was a, a, a cricket fanatic who played as well. So I grew up watching him and his friends play. So between, between that and the fact that I grew up on a street with kids my age who, who played a lot of cricket as well, um, one thing led to another, but that was the starting point for it. Buckle ball or box ball? Which one was it? Well, everything, you know, catch it should be. Um, <laughs> six are out, one bounce out, tennis ball, you know, box ball, anything. golf ball, anything, anything, anything. <laughs> well, you, you know, it is, you know, it is, you know, it is as kids growing up, it's, it's all about having fun. It's not really about the, the level of equipment that you have. And, and we had fun, you know. Um, but yeah, so that was it. That was basically the genesis of the whole thing. So what about sighting? Do you play that as well? Yeah, we do a little bit of that. We, I mean, we used to mix so much, you know, all them hopscotch and, and, and you know, skipping rope thing or anything, mm -hmm. anything we keep you active. But cricket and football really was the two main things for, for boys growing up in, in, mm -hmm. in our part of Jamaica. And as I said, because of the love that the, the, the families and all the youth my age, all of them had fathers who were into the game and, and played. So the, you, we watch our fathers play and, and we are modeling them, so to speak, you know. Well, you mentioned football. I was going to ask what other sport you played. So it would be football. Yes, I, I played quite a bit of football up to about age 16, 17. And then cricket kind of took over time-wise. So I didn't have the time thereafter because cricket became a 12 months a year project. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I've... I still have a, a love for the game. I like watching it. Can't play it because it's physically too demanding now. But yes, I played quite a bit of football in, in the early. Who inspired you to play cricket? Well, like I said initially, my old man. Uh, but when you when you look at if you talk about heroes that you'd have seen growing up, I, I would mm. have to say Michael Holding and Vivian Richards were my idols growing up. They they would have been the two who, as a youngster, if you're outside playing with your friends, you want to be like them. So it, it probably would have been those two more than any other. And then who did you hope to inspire by playing cricket? Well, it, I'm going to answer that in a, in a funny kind of way. I, I never really played thinking about inspiring anybody, to be honest. I just played because I love the game. I, I will say that if, if people come and say that, I have been an inspiration. I, I take that as, a, as an added bonus. But very selfishly, I, I've, I've only ever played any sport uh, because I, I really have a, a love for the sport mm -hmm. and I enjoy doing it. So I, I, didn't yeah. really play, I didn't really play to inspire anybody per se. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if it has come out of it, then I am, I am happy that that has happened. Your debut as a West Indies cricketer began with your first match against South Africa in Barbie. Who do you describe your experience? You know, when you knew that you were being selected, you know, you know that you're going to go on the field. What was it like? Well, I will try and answer that by, by giving a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, a story, I guess. I think for me, there, there were certain things that, that stood out as iconic images of West Indies cricket and, and to, to have been given my first test cap, that maroon cap that West Indian cricketers still wear to this day, was, was very special to me. And I can tell you that the two nights, two days leading into the test match and for the five days of that test match, I, I hardly slept. I found it very difficult to sleep at night, just the whole excitement. And, you know, you were, you were really now living out something that you had dreamt about for many, many, many years. And it was a very exciting few days for me, roughly about a week. And there was very little sleep. But we got through it okay, so as well that ends with it. <laughs> All right, you mentioned the fact that you couldn't sleep. Could you uh, give me one or two advice on how you handled anxiety before and during a match? Well, I, I think with experience, with a little bit of time and a few games under your belt, you, you developed a routine. I would have had a routine from, from playing for Jamaica for quite a few years. 
and basically you you you, you pretty much transfer that to the next level. So I don't think much change. The, the, the bit, I want to eat by a certain time. I want to get a minimum of a certain amount of hours sleep per night. And, and once I was able to carry out my routine, having that routine was pretty much of a calming influence on me. So you'd have, mm -hmm. your, you'd have your natural butterflies going into a game. And that lasted right throughout my career. The night before a test match, uh, it, it, I don't find it that easy to sleep because a lot of what ifs are running through your mind. But once you, once you get started on the first day, for instance, your, your routine kicks in in terms of, you know, I want to eat by a certain time. You know, I, I want to be settled. Uh, you know, I, I don't really deal with a lot of company on the night before a game as well. Uh, I like to have time for myself on that, that night going into the first day. But so I took comfort from the routine and the routine really helped calm me down and, and prevented me from getting a, an over excessive attack of nerves. You'd always have butterflies, which is a good thing because the butterflies keep you honest and, and keep you at a certain level of arousal so that you can perform. But you don't want to go too far above that. And obviously you don't want to be too low where when you need to react very quickly, you, you can't make quick decisions. So I would say the biggest calming factor for me was a routine that worked for me that I trusted and, and once I could carry out that routine I was I was pretty much in a good place. So the mental preparation is for both the short version of cricket and the long versions? All versions even if I was playing a 10-10 a game once there was something on the game at any level not just international level if, if I'm playing professional cricket in the UK or if I'm playing for Jamaica or playing club cricket for Kingston every level once you once you had a very strong desire to succeed, which I would have had at most levels that I played, there would be a little bit of pre-match nerves. There would be a little bit of nervousness that you get before you go and bat, that kind of thing. But you came to recognize that at a certain level, it was actually a good thing that you needed. And you learned very early in your career to control it so that you, 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 you don't get too nervous and, and go the, the other way and, and make silly mistakes because of it. Having served as a West Indian captain, how did you handle criticism? And do you think the media know adds on a different level of pressure than, you know, before your time or do you, during your time? I think there's more pressure now simply because I think media has grown. Uh, I think what, what a youngster nowadays has to deal with through social media and through how he has become socialized to social media is a lot different from my time. In my time, you had to deal with radio, TV, and newspapers. Now you can triple that with all the social media outlets that you have and the way in which it can invade your space. And mm -hmm. that is a fact. So I don't know if my method in my time would have worked. No. I, I, I found it very easy to unplug the phone in the, in the hotel room so you couldn't call me. Uh, I, I, I read very little of the media, the printed media. I was, I was, and I came to realize very early on that I was the one who was responsible for controlling my headspace. And when I say my headspace, I mean what I was allowing in. So, again, without getting into too much detail, I, I'd be very controlling over who would come into my inner circle when mm. it was leading into the big games in my life. So, you know, I, I wouldn't hang out with any and anybody starting from about two or three days out from a test match. I was very selective. Because I only wanted positivity around me. I didn't want words said that I might carry into a game that might get me off. Mm. I, 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 I wouldn't be reading the print media either before or during a test match. Even if I was doing well, I, I just, I'd learned at an early level to stay away from it. Because the last thing you want to do is, is especially if you're not in a good place, there will be the tendency to carry that into your head on the field. And the, the potential for mistakes becomes greater. But as I said, I was only dealing with print media, radio and TV. Now, oh gosh, when you look at all the media platforms that you have, uh, I, it's a different world now. Uh, but I still, I will still maintain that the, the, the better players are the ones who learn to control their headspace very well. And a large part of that, when I speak to them now, is that a lot of them are still very controlling of what they allow in, what they allow themselves to hear, see, think about because they know that under pressure it is very easy for negative thoughts to come in if you've been feeding yourself negativity leading into a big event so they tend to do the same thing we would have done back in our day but 
probably they're better at it because they have to do it over a wider mm. media platform, you know. What's your stance on women being dominant in a male-dominated sport? Of, of women being, sorry? Of women being dominant in a male-dominated sport. Well, if you're asking me about women's cricket, I, I totally support it. Uh, I, I'm, I think it's the next big frontier in, in cricket. Is, is, and, and the growth of women's cricket in the last 10 years has proven that, that there is a market and that people are, are more than willing to support it and, and view it as, as, for want of a better term, primetime entertainment. Mm. I, 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 I understand the differences in standards between any women's sport and, and men's sport in anything. But I, for the sports that I love, Football, cricket, athletics, I, I can get just as much pleasure from watching women do it well as, 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 as watching men do it well. What does national cricket mean to you? Explain. In regards to, you know, representation, the fact that you can represent the black, green and gold. Oh, Jamaica. Oh, massive, massive, massive. I, I, I will say this. I, I, I think I've got a bigger buzz at the second half of my career, so while I was playing mm. international cricket, I would have gotten a bigger buzz, a bigger high from playing international cricket, but I had more fun playing for Jamaica mm. because you're playing with guys who you grew up with from under 15, under 16, come right through, now you're playing for Jamaica. So there are some relationships. Uh, myself and Nima Perry would have played with and against each other from we were 15 years old and we went right through to international level. And, and you get a buzz when you, when you, when you go to, to represent the West Indies, but when you when you come up home now to play for Jamaica, you, you, I used to have more fun because it's, it's like you're coming back to your family type thing. You know? hmm. I've watched a few videos where you mention a lot, and you've mentioned it now even on the mental fortitude that you developed over the years. It's a case oh, that gosh, you stop have. Using, stop using stop using big word, no man. You mean fortitude? <laughs> what, what 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 you mean? You said mental mental fortitude. strength. That you had a very oh god, you said mental strength, no man. You have them big word like you are confusing people. <laughs> <laughs> you said Sorry. that. It's a case where. Sorry, that, was, that was just an icebreaker because you're, you're coming across <laughs> so stiff and, and you know, formal. You know, you formalize it a little bit. No? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my word. Yes. So, is this a case where you had it from, you know, well, your father instilled it or something that you developed over the years? I think you developed that, you know. I, I think you can have a predisposition to your environment when you're growing up. Yes. So, mm -hmm. Or you'll get trained at home and maybe your early school life and stuff like that. But there are experiences that you will have along the way. Coupled with maybe an environment that promotes mental strengthening. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you'll, have, you'll have critical moments in your career that, as I say, potentially can make you or break you. And if it doesn't break you, then it definitely makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those tend to be some, some of your bigger disappointments that you have to fight your way back from. But in, 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 in coming back, there are all important lessons that you need to go through to become stronger mentally. So you need to feel, you need to overcome the fear of failure. You need to understand how to work your way back when nobody's paying you any mind and it's just you alone in the world, nobody business with you, you get dropped, the team has moved on, you are back at home and you have the choice. You can have a pity party for the next two months or you can get angry and frustrated and use that to drive you to go back out and work even harder than you were doing before. And then when you make it back, you are now a stronger person, a stronger player. Mm. So those are, so, uh, it's a, it's a, we, we would not be able to go into all the different angles that, that comes into mental strength. Uh, and mm. some of it, I don't know. But I do know that it is not something that you are born with. I think that it is something that you learn. Some of it you learn maybe even before you get to an age where you're conscious that you're learning it based on how your parents are, your environment is shaped. But um, I, 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 I think anybody who gets to the international level and stays there for an extended period of mm -hmm. time has a basic level of mental strength, just like anybody who gets to a finals in a 100 meter Olympics will have a basic amount of power that, that, that is going to carry them over the line in 10 seconds or less. And, and they weren't born with that power physically. They developed that over a period of time. And, and mental strength is no different. Anything that you're getting stronger at is something that you have developed over a period, usually through 
a lot of hard work and you know your usual amount of failures and comebacks and stuff like that. All right. So that at the same time, you are for athletes getting counseling, as in seeking a sports psychologist. Then, if they can't do it themselves, well, do it by themselves. Well, this is an area in 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 elite sport that has grown uh, a lot in the last 15, 20 years. There's no more science behind it. It's more empirical now, and and it is available now on a much wider scale. Uh, I, I would say that as somebody who's heavily involved in, in elite development for, for cricket players, I, I see it as a, as a must have. Mm-hmm. And, and if I could wave a magic wand, it is something that I would have from the elite junior level, because like most things, it is very hard to, to, to bend the bow after a certain amount of time. So I, I do believe in it. I, I do believe that you can teach mental coping skills I, I believe that you can you can employ strategies and interventions from an early age that can create a mentally stronger player earlier mm-hmm. um, in, indeed you can you can produce a mentally stronger player period versus somebody who might be very gifted technically but weak self as parish mentally so it, it uh, there is a place for it uh, it is now a non-negotiable in any elite sporting environment from from junior levels right to um, and, and when you talk about uh, support from sports psych or, 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 or mental, mental conditioning, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a if or but no. It is, it's, it's a part of any elite program in, in today's world. All right. So I'm going to give you five words. Granted, I have a surprise question for you. But yeah, anytime, you- remember, remember, <laughs> always said no comment, you know. <laughs> I'm going to give you five words yeah. and you tell me what they mean to you. Five words. The first one. Five words. Well, 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 you you, you give me all five or one at a time. One at a time, man. One at a time. What kind of what kind of what kind of what kind of mind what kind of brain thing it's this year? It's not a mind with? game. It's just you know, honestly, just you know, maybe like two seconds. And you no, some some of my brain not work like that. I'm a very reflective person. You know, so you throw something out. It uh, tomorrow morning, it's still a thing about the same word. You know? <laughs> All right, I'll give you like five seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, you see, you look at the pressure you put me under. No, me start getting butterfly. You call me under pressure. You feel like me under pressure. No, you make me start stammer. <laughs> you know, that's the one. Trust me, you'll be fine. Trust All right. me. All right. You'll be fine. What All is right. my role? First what is my role? What is my current role? Two seconds. Your current role, director of cricket? Oh, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. going <laughs> things. You're yeah, going things, boys. You're sharp. You're sharp. Ready, though. All right, so the first, wo- the first word. What's him? Akram? Best bowler in the world. Best bowler in the wor- world. Courtney Walsh? Strongest bowler in the world. Cricket? Love it. Family? Love it even more. Jamaica? Boy, I'm tell you, just between family and cricket. <laughs> Those are the five. All right, so oh, we're done already. Yeah. We're done already. That's probably like when you get an injection in your hand and you're sick for something where I hurt you and then oh you're brave, so you put all your teeth and then the nurse tell you, say, oh, you get out of that chair because you don't get the thing already. And you Easily. never even know. Mm. <laughs> and so the last question. I need hmm, one ball. Can so now, after one. this, we're done. After this interview, we're done. Yeah, after this, we're finished. Oh, yes, we can't have I'm a conversation. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> getting it. Go on. All right. Go on. Then. Go on. <laughs> all right. So. One ball can make a difference. One week can make a difference. I need for you to give me one word, one one simple word to describe your journey thus far. One word. Interesting. Interesting. Why interesting? Mm-mm. I treat I'm <laughs> asking by the last question. You know? no, Three times I ask you, and you say yes, yes, yes. Oh, I say you come now. With that next no, one, you're coming like the photographer. You know, you're coming like the photographers in India that say one more, one more picture, one more, one no, more. And you're one more. Take one more. Then run behind you and say one more. Trust <laughs> me, this is the last one. Why interesting? Why not? It has been. It has been. It has been. Yeah, and it continues to be an interesting journey um, for many reasons. Uh, never. <sighs> you, 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 there are so many things that, that you can't predict. Mm-hmm. Um, that, and that is part of the attraction of, of what I have done, whether playing or, or administering the game, mm-hmm. is that sport is, is gloriously uncertain. 
And some people don't like that. Some people need the certainty and every day is the same type thing. Uh, not in this role and certainly even as a player, every day was, was completely different. And it would show up interesting scenarios hour by hour. And, and it continues to be like that. So I would say the, 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 probably the biggest description from start to now has been interesting. Interesting. And this has been an interesting interview, honestly. I will, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> thank you again, Mr. Adams. Um, My pleasure. Thank you so much. And I appreciate it. And I, sh and I hope Jamaica appreciates it too.